Welcome to the Mr. Beacon podcast. What if you could turn God mode on in the real world and suddenly see up and down a supply chain in real time? This is uh, something that you assume that maybe you can do now, but hardly anyone can. No one can, I would uh, say. And uh, the reason is interoperability and standards and software. And today I'm going to be talking with a gentleman who I think has the key to turning on God mode and giving real-time visibility upstream, downstream, across supply chains. His name is Kurt Schacker, and uh, he's part of a startup called TrackVision, who are pioneering the use of digital link and EPCIS to supply chains. And you know this may seem a little obscure, but uh, I really uh, believe that this supply chain visibility uh, capacity is central to the future of the way business is done throughout the world. We are really using 19th, 20th century paradigms where you sell a product to someone and that's it. You lose visibility of it. If we're going to solve problems like food safety, drug safety, if we're going to be able to manage climate change and understand what the carbon footprint of things are, um, if we're going to drive a level of efficiency which will define new winners and new losers in uh, the supply chain business that is essentially the business of food and retail and uh, building things generally, then supply chain visibility is fundamental to it. It'll separate the well-run companies from the companies that are stuck in the past. So how do we unlock this? Well, I think Kurt has some really good answers to that. Um, and I hope you enjoy my conversation with him. Kurt, welcome to the Mr. Beacon podcast. Thanks, Steve. Great to be here. Well, I am really looking forward to picking your brains. You are an industry uh, veteran. You've done some really interesting things. I do want to get into your forays into space travel or exploration, I should say, <laughs> later on. But before we go into the Hubble telescope and that, uh, I want to talk to you about this uh, relatively new company that, uh, that you are part of, uh, TrackVision, who are commercializing... EPCIS 2.0 and Digital Link. Um, uh, and those, you know, I, I think what you're doing is really, really important. Um, uh, supply chain visibility, traceability, and opening up the exchange of data about the supply chain amongst different parties, I think is tremendously important to solving some very big problems uh, food safety, climate change, just making the shopping experience better, making it more efficient, giving people information that they need to make better decisions. And in the on the podcast, we have covered those standards, EPCIS 2.0 and Digital Link, uh, uh, interviewing an old colleague of yours, uh, Dominic Gennard, uh, who yes. was involved. Um, so his friend, colleague, a lot to talk about. Why don't we start off with just the elevator pitch on track vision, mm -hmm. and then we can peel that apart and talk a bit about what you're doing and why you're doing it and how you ended up doing it. But, but sure. for people that have never heard of track vision, who are you and what do you do? Yeah, so we are a startup. Uh, the company is, uh, is based actually in London in the UK, and that's because a lot of the folks that I'm working with are former colleagues that were based there. Um, but we started the company, as you suggested, in response to what we perceived to be a pretty fundamental challenge in the world of supply chains. Um, and it has to do with really the nature of how supply chains are constructed. Uh, and what that is, is they're largely, supply chains today are largely built on proprietary implementations um, that are supported by a number of different vendors. Um, and, um, and that means that um, the data is stored in proprietary formats, the APIs for exchanging information are proprietary, uh, and so on. And um, if you're within a closed system and everybody's using that particular um, application from that vendor, then 
I suppose the world works fine, but the, the problem is, is that um, as soon as you open that up and one participant um, is not using that system, the whole thing come, kind of comes to a screeching halt. Uh, and that's a long way of saying that we, we the the paradigm for supply chains today does not support interoperability. Um, uh, to the extent that people do um, exchange information, those exchanges are built on a point-to-point -point basis, uh, which are expensive. Um, they are kind of brittle. They are uh, they're difficult to scale. Um, and you can imagine, you know, the exponential complexity that happens. The more participants you have, the more complex the system gets. Um, and so. That's not a good state of affairs for the world. And, and again, as you suggested, um, there are a set of modern business challenges uh, that, um, that we face that are really challenging that status quo. Um, a lot of this falls under what people call supply chain traceability, um, which is sort of the ability to visualize um, up and down your supply chain, all the way to source in one direction and all the way to you know, the consumer in the other direction. Uh, and um, we can't do that today with the existing architecture. Now, fortunately, as you said, there are a couple of standards that have come on the scene, courtesy of uh, GS1 Standards Organization. One of those has been around for a while. It's called the Digital Link. Um, and um, if you scanned a QR code, you've probably interacted with a digital link. Uh, there's much more to it than just you know pointing you to a web page, and we can certainly talk about that. But the other one um, is EPCIS, and in particular, the 2.0 version of EPCIS. That standard was ratified by GS1 only last June, uh, and it is the other key building block. And I'm sure we'll talk about you know, how those standards operate. But the two together offer us an opportunity to really fundamentally transform the paradigm and the nature of supply chains um, in the sense that um, if everybody adopts those open standards, um, we suddenly get a world where interoperability just falls out of the um, out of the system by by its design, um, and system integration really kind of disappears. It's um, connecting two suppliers or trading partners in a supply chain is is just as easy as opening up a browser and go to a web page. Um, and you know we're we're past due for that kind of revolution. Um, if we look at um, other networks like the internet, the World Wide Web, financial networks, cellular networks, and so on, they all rely fundamentally on standards and on the adoption and deployment of those standards by all participants. And that's why they work as well as they do and, and create the tremendous value that we enjoy. Um, it's not that way for supply chains. We think it should be that way. Um, and, um, you know, we're going to take a bet on seeing if we can help make that happen. Excellent. So I, I want to explore what does the world look like after we've all got the religion or, or actually it's not religion. It's, it's kind of very, uh, kind of doesn't require faith. It's all a matter of logic. Uh, um, it yeah. seems to me that we are operating supply chains in the dark and, and right. I, you know, working for William, I have a perspective on some of the, the, the reasons why that's the case, but irrespective of the data carrier, whether you're using QR codes, RFID or ambient IOT, that's just kind of an identifier. You need to exchange much more than just a, a asset ID up and down the supply chain. Mm -hmm. So what is it that your company does to enable that interoperability? What, what are you actually selling? Mm -hmm. Well, we're providing a platform that is um, based uh, on the, the, the very standards that you talked about. So GS1 Digital Link uh, and EPCS 2.0 are built into uh, the platform that we've architected. Um, and uh, it manifests as some tools that enterprises can use to um, operate their supply chains uh, in a way that are based on those standards. So we have a supplier portal where suppliers who are selling goods can enter uh, information about their products, their batches and so forth, label them with digital links um, and you know, ship those uh, into their trading partners and their, and their trading partners, the receivers of those goods can interact with those labels as they come in again using our software extract that information from that uh, digital link um, and record that supply chain event uh, all in a standardized way. Um, and if any, and that can be done on an end-to-end -end basis. So any number of suppliers can do that with any number of their, of their customers or their, their buyers. Um, and it requires really no 
out of the box or no pre-system integration. We don't have to agree on how we're going to talk about things, how we're going to name things, how we're going to label things, what data structures or formats that we're going to use. It simply falls out of the infrastructure. So we are providing a set of tools that enterprises of all size um, can utilize within their organizations to operate their supply chains uh, based on these standards. So you described some um, some screens, some management screens that could be used and the kind of information that you get out. But are you providing an end-to-end solution? Is it a full stack? Uh, or are you thinking of this as essentially a platform that other people build applications on top of? Well, it's um, I think it's somewhere in between. I mean, we have to be cognizant of the fact that these proprietary systems exist, and nobody's going to turn around and throw them out overnight. Um, these are these are big companies and big businesses, and and you know, enterprises and organizations are utilizing this functionality on a very wide basis. So we we can't just sort of stop doing one thing and start doing something different. Um, uh, so what we provide is the ability to um, for companies to use our software um, in partnership with those applications. So if you're using SAP, for example, to, to manage your supply chain, that's great. Continue to use SAP and however data is represented and manipulated and, and utilized within that system can continue to do how, how it's being done today. But you don't have to force your partners to all use SAP in order to communicate with you. Mm-hmm. So if you plug track vision, if you will, kind of in between and what we will do is we will provide for the communications with those other systems to be done within the standard. And if somebody else is using a system from Oracle, hey, no problem. They'll get the they'll get the information in EPCS format with digital links. They can ingest that into their Oracle Oracle system and continue to operate uh, the way that uh, that they always have been. But what they're not doing is having to force somebody to. Um, comply with their way of doing things. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, that is just a very clunky way to operate. And, and that's what we're trying to affect a positive change toward. And we'll get into a bit more detail on Digital Link and EPCIS for people that don't really understand what those are and haven't watched the episodes with, uh, with Dominic that explains that in isolation. But just Back to the fundamentals of what you're hoping to achieve and how you're hoping to achieve it. Um, so you you give the ability of people that have these big, huge uh, uh, enterprise applications that manage part of the supply chain to potentially interoperate and exchange data, uh, uh, insights, sensing information uh, um, up and down the supply chain. Is that anybody else that's implemented the standard in the way you have? Because it seems like your, your, your company is born, I think, out of some frustration that no one's really implementing the standards properly. Doesn't that give you a fundamental problem of if no one's implementing the standards, how can you interoperate with, uh, yeah. with others uh, because no one else has implemented the standards? Absolutely. Um, and I think all standards, you know, all technologies originate as proprietary technologies and, and perhaps unless with the exception of st- stuff that was developed within the government. Um, but all standards ultimately have that problem. You've got to migrate from the proprietary way of doing it to one based on standards. Um, mm-hmm. And um, it's a slow process at the beginning. Um, and But, you know, as adoption picks up, um, you sort of get this accelerated curve and eventually reach a tipping point and it starts to make sense for everybody. But you're right, we've got to start somewhere. Um, and, um, you know, one of the ways we're going to get some help is from some government mandates that are coming out um, that are dictating uh, or uh, mandating that um, that some of these standards are used uh, to accomplish the goals that they're they're attempting to achieve um, mm-hmm. through the regulations that they're that they're providing. Um, but yes, I mean, we're a startup and startups make bets. This is a big bet. You're absolutely right. If nobody picks up this standard, well then track vision will have to find something else to do, but we think it's a, it's, it's a worthy uh, bet to make. Um, and we know we're not the only ones. We're probably, we're one of the only ones that has started from a clean slate though, um, and have been able to base, um, all of the, um, the applications and the algorithms within our system based natively on the standards. Um, mm-hmm. And that's probably an advantage that we have. And of course, we've been able to 
leverage a lot of the advances in modern computing that have happened over the last few years. But the other, so most of the other implementations that are out there, at least the ones that I'm aware of, um, are more um, where uh, they have um, sort of bolted on, if you will, the standards onto the side uh, onto the side of their systems. And so there's sort of an internal transformation process that's happening, um, which I think is fine. And that may be, you know, if if I was um, retrofitting an existing system, that's probably the way I would do it too. Um, but we think there's a lot of sense in um, in building a platform natively around those standards. Where do you think the sweet spot is for what you're uh, doing? Uh, you, you mentioned these regulatory um, uh, mandates, and that's uh, ob obviously a great thing for anyone that's uh, building a business plan to, to look at this compelling need to change. Where do you see uh, the biggest opportunities, the opportunities that are moving the fastest? Well, I think it's I think it's a function of if you go back to what are some of the business challenges that are very difficult to address with the current paradigm, um, and then think about where those challenges are most acute. That's sort of the fertile ground to play in. So take recall as an example. Um, the world has a very big problem with recall, and a lot of effort is going into figuring out how we get that bad lettuce off the. The shelf before people get sick, and there's some really good work that's that's going on there. Of course, the FDA is is leading the charge, I would say, with the FISMA 204 uh, Act, um, which goes into full effect uh, in January um, of 2026. Um, and so, you know, they're basically requiring uh, a certain set of foods that are listed on what they call a food traceability list, uh, and the handlers of those foods to be a, to respond to a traceability request from the FDA within a 24-hour period. Um, and so um, if you look at uh, recall as an application um, within the supply chain, then that makes um, food certainly an area to focus on. Um, and so that's one of the areas indeed that we uh, that we believe there's a lot of opportunity for track vision. There are some other, um, again, applications uh, that are related to supply chains. Um, there's a lot of concern around carbon emissions, naturally enough, in the world. Um, we're a little bit critical of what we think is the, um, the kind of state of the art uh, that we've seen right now for calculating carbon emissions, which are, at least what I've seen, based kind of on averaging and taking a snapshot in time. Um, and saying, well, you know, in general, this is what they are based on the construction of your supply chain. And here we're talking, by the way, mostly about what are called scope three emissions, which are actually the majority of, of the of the impact of a carbon footprint. Um, so there's the business, that, there's the carbon that you generate within your own organization. But when you ask somebody to do something for you, they have to emit carbon uh, to fulfill that commitment. And those are called scope three emissions, and they're actually the largest part um, of the carbon footprint of, of, of any organization. Um, so again, the way it's done today is sort of audits and averages and estimates and snapshots in time. And the problem with that is that it assumes the supply chain is very static, um, which it's not. So, um, you know, one of the examples we use, if I'm buying two chairs, um, those chairs may be identical in every way from the standpoint of they have the same G10, the same SKU, the same materials, but the sourcing of those materials could have been quite different. Um, and those differences have a meaningful impact on that carbon score. If the lumber, let's say it's a wooden chair, if the lumber that went into that chair was sourced um, in Brazil while the chair was made in China versus being sourced in, say, Sri Lanka um, and made in China, that's a very different trip um, to get that wood from one place to another. And there is a um, there's a meaningful, um, in fact, that particular example, the impact of that emission probably actually outweighs all of the other emissions combined. Um, and so um, if you actually had end-to-end -end supply chain visibility um, on an ongoing basis, um, it would be trivial. It is trivial um, actually to interrogate the digital links of those finished products and follow the digital links within that link. It's kind of a breadcrumb trail all the way back to source materials. And then just simply apply an algorithm. Um, how much does this thing weigh, this, this material I used? How far did it travel? And what mode of transportation did it take? And with those three inputs, I can come up with a pretty accurate estimate of what those carbon emissions or calculation of what those emissions were. So chair number one is X, chair number two is, is Y. And you can't get that with, with averaging and, and estimates and, and audits.
Yeah. So it seems like if I'm actually going to give a credible accounting of the carbon footprint of my organization, which I'm now obliged to under SEC rules, then I need to know that information. And at the moment, we're kind of doing these very, very high level yeah. once a year uh, annual exercises. But what you're yeah. talking about is instrumenting the supply chain to get ground truth and being able to tell what the carbon footprint is of one product versus another. Right. And I think, you know, once you do that, um, it's a short step to provide that real information to consumers and then they can start to weigh in and not just consumers, but anyone that's buying the product and they can favor the low carbon approach. And then suddenly we're employing the massive engine of capitalism to drive improvement and carbon reduction. But we can't do it unless we have the data and we can't get the data unless we can exchange the data up and down the supply chain. So I, I think what you're doing there is really important. I don't underestimate how far we've got to go because this is just a huge leap. So I, I think um, your focus on uh, food safety and there's a very, very short term regulatory driver uh, around the Food Safety Modernization Act. And we've had Frank Yanis, the architect of FISMA 204 on this podcast, and he talks about it for anyone that wants to get into that. But, um, you know, I have taken an interest in the regulation. It's, uh, I think, uh, for any of us that are involved in real-time supply chain visibility, it's, um, you know, a huge opportunity to show the benefits of what we do. Um, but, I and what I've seen when I sit in on the GS1 working group is, you know, there are some legacy standards that may, if you twist and turn, uh, be fit for purpose using EDI advanced shipping notices, electronic data interchange advanced shipping notices. That's a form of passing data, but it doesn't really contemplate the structure that we're talking about. There's nowhere in the EDI spec there where it talks about uh, food traceability, uh, let alone carbon footprint. And it tends to cover the original shipment into the, you know, the DC, but maybe not from the, the DC to the grocery store or the uh, warehouse. So it certainly doesn't cover the, uh, the receiving events, which are part of Shipping and receiving events are the kind of the, 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 the fundamental links in the food safety chain. And there's no question in my mind that EPCIS is the best way of uh, documenting and capturing the receiving events. What is it that I got in, in the, the back door of the restaurant? Um, because, you know, theory, there's no question the theory of what you should get and what you actually get is not always the same. And the regulation says you need to be accurate and anyone that's ordered anything online and ever received a surprise delivery that wasn't, well, what wasn't, was not what they ordered knows that, um, that this needs to be validated and verified. So two good areas to focus on. I'm going to pause because I'm on a bit of a rant, but I do want to ask you about other use cases as well. But anything else you want to, more you want to say on uh, the food safety and the carbon front? Well, I, um, I mean, I think those are, I think recall, um, I think carbon, I think general provenance, um, you know, another area is what we sort of call certifications. Um, so, you know, if, again, if I'm buying that chair, um, I probably care at some level, and certainly a lot of people care about where those source materials were from. Um, we have areas that are sanctioned. Um, we know that things like, you know, bad things like forced labor, child labor, deforestation happens. Um, and there are organizations that are certifying, providing certifications to manufacturers, producers, farmers, et cetera. Um, and those certifications can be essentially attached to the digital link for the materials that they're producing. And so again, the power of this is imagine having the digital link for a finished product uh, and being able to use that digital link to access all of those upstream materials all the way back to source. So not only do I get to do interesting things like calculate carbon, but I also get to know where this product was made. I get to know um, whether the, that area that it was made or where those materials were sourced were subject to any kind of sanctions um, from any government organizations. 
Um, I can read their certifications um, in digital form about their compliance with rules and, and laws um, and, and, and moral issues like child labor. Um, and again, I can make business decisions. Um, and, and you know, as you, you talked about, um, if this information is surfaced to consumers, they can make business decisions, but also the enterprises and the, the retailers and the manufacturers can also um, decide who they want to work with um, based on that, you know, that transparent information that they're now being provided. Again, with the system, the way it works today, it's all pretty much opaque. You have to pay, take people's word for, you know, what they're telling you. Um, and we just think there's a better way to do it. One thing we will talk about, I'm sure, is in you know the big upgrade that happened with EPCS 2.0, and that's why we always say the 2.0, um, is it really was the webification of supply chain tracking. And that's why the digital link is so very, very important. Most people think of a digital link as, hey, you can put it into a QR code and you can scan and it'll redirect you to a website. And that's how most people use them, it's fine. But a digital link can carry a lot more information. And in particular, you can attach other digital links uh, to that digital link. And that's where you get the breadcrumb trail. So I, if I buy that chair and that chair has some, some wood in it, I can have the digital link for the batch of wood that was provided um, to the manufacturer of that chair. Um, and if I have the digital link to that, that can contain the digital link to the lumber uh, the planks uh, that were used uh, to to uh, to manufacture that, and I can follow that all the way back to source. And all I need is the web address. Um, if I scan that web address, all of that information suddenly becomes available. And as a result of that, I think um, we get something really, really fundamentally different because all of these things that we're talking about, all these business challenges, are are sort of. Um, attacked on kind of a request response basis. Like I'm operating in, you know, in my world, everything is fine and suddenly something bad happens and I've got to track it down and I've got to do whatever, use whatever tools or mechanisms or obey whatever laws have been, um, you know, mandated uh, to do that, right? But if we really, really had um, true end-to-end -end traceability, why can't that just be a monitoring system? Why can't I just have a dashboard? that I can look at anytime I want, or that can alert me that if any upstream material um, that uh, that I'm basing my product on um, has been subjected to a recall, why can't I just know that immediately? Why do I have to wait and ask for a report or conduct uh, really any kind of forensic investigation? It's going from this request response model to a subscription model. Just I want to subscribe to the things I care about, recalled products, um, that poorly performing performing uh, carbon emission situations, um, source materials that are coming from areas that I don't want to do business in. Why can't I just be told that? And and really, the ultimate expression of what we're uh, what we're gunning for here uh, is is that ability. I think it's tremendously worthwhile. Um, what. And and I, I have to sort of check myself. I get all excited about, yeah, I, I want to be able to buy furniture. And I know it's not come from a freshly clear-cut part of the Amazon uh, uh, rainforest. Uh, uh, or or I, 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 So I don't want the wood that was used for the clear-cutting. And I don't want the, uh, um, the dairy products or the meat from uh, cows that have been grazing there. And, and actually, there's European legislation that says that I need to be able to, to prove that. So there's a regulatory driver. So this is all, you know, compliance, better world. Uh, it's kind of the meaningful to people's lives. Um, but w what about profit? W where do you think the biggest money-making opportunities are from what you're offering? Yeah. Well, you know what? Um, we have to think about this hard. Obviously, as a startup, we have to present a viable, you know, business going forward. And certainly, um, and you know, you know, that's going to be the first question investors are going to ask. Um, but you know, I think that one of the things that people forget is, you know, in a proprietary world, it's sort of this winner take all model. I'm going to win because I'm going to force everybody, or I'm going to get convince everybody to use my system. And of course. The world pushes back against that because um, we sort of don't like monopolies. Um, but we believe, you know, sort of the arc of history ultimately pushes towards standards and, and interoperability. And so you have to be able to build a business around the assumption of the existence of standards. And there are ways to do that. 
Um, look at all the companies that um, that were formed in the sort of late 80s, early 90s that exploded in growth, doing nothing other than implementing the, the protocols of the internet, Cisco systems making routers. I mean, all that's doing is taking standard packets coming in and routing them to someplace else in the next hop in the line. Somebody could have criticized that business and said, well, anybody could do that. Well, perhaps, but you know, um, there is a business to be made about being first, about being best in uh, implementing standards. And I think that's what we're aiming to do. Um, get yes. out there first and be the best implementation that we can absolutely be. And we're happy to compete on that basis. We do not expect to be a monopoly, nor do we want to be a monopoly. If if we're the only ones doing this, as you pointed out at the beginning, it's a fail. It's a failure, right? But but we think we can build a healthy business on that. And one of the things you know that we're missing right now from all of this is that we tend to talk about supply chains in the context of really big enterprises that have big IT budgets, budgets and departments and so forth. But what about the small farmer with a ten acre farm that's just you know, growing lettuce and shipping it to the supermarket, right? What are those poor people supposed to do? You know, yeah. and they're kind of left out of the equation today. And and you know, the way it kind of works today is you've got these. I mean, literally, um, paper. Uh, you know, sending pieces of paper that that say, "I'm shipping you this." Here's a case of lettuce, and it's batch number X Y Z. And you take that piece of paper and you enter it into your system. I mean, we can do way better than that. Um, we think we have constructed the platform in such a way that it is eminently affordable all the way down to that small farmer running that 10 acre farm um, we can get this technology into their hands they can supply uh, their downstream customers all of them they can use one approach and support all of their customers uh, and um, we can do that very affordably and there's there's a good business to be made doing that as well as to supporting the mid and and, and large companies yeah, so in a world where more data exchange is being required, where you can't just ship the product, you need to ship information about the product, then you can help players like that save money uh, with a cost-effective standards-based way of sending the data to both Kroger and Walmart and Target and Amazon. So, uh, so you've convince me that there's definitely a business model for you and that you can make profit being the the Cisco of uh, exchanging data in the supply chain. But what I was thinking about was, you know, are there any other use cases where a buyer might say, well, I can really make a lot of money. And I think what I got out of your answer was A, you can make money and B, you can save money for other people. But are there any other use cases that you can think of where this visibility just allows you to generate more revenue or is it really a cost saving thing and a compliance thing? Well, I think those are the initial drivers, but you know, that's, um, and, and, you know, I, I probably could think of, of some additional ideas, maybe not yeah, quite yeah. on the spot, but I think, you know, I think we have to, you know, have a belief in what the standards enable. I mean, you know, when, when, when the World Wide Web Consortium sat down and started writing the standards for the web that is fundamentally architect to sit on top of the internet, I don't think anybody in their right mind had any idea there could be such a thing as Amazon and Facebook and Google and all those yeah. all those companies that are so much a bit so much a part of our life today yeah. um, are um, you know were were not even considered uh, at that point in time. So. I believe that when you create an ecosystem that everybody can participate in, there's a there's a value creation environment, and those applications will come about. And you know, if we do a good job here, we don't have to be the ones that come up with those applications. Um, anybody can can build applications on top of the standard infrastructure. They don't have to build something and port it to ten different environments because of all the proprietary systems out there. They can build it to the standard. Uh, market it to everybody using the standard. And um, I think the value creation will be tremendous. Um, I don't know that we will be in that business or not. Um, perhaps that will be a direction of travel for us in the future. But as you said, you know, we've we've got, you know, some heavy lifting to do in the in the early days to get the standard off the ground. Very good. So let's just talk a bit more about the standards. I, th I think you did a nice job of explaining that, you know, this digital link thing is it's not, it's it's a web address it's a url if you like that is pointing to 
data about the product um, rather than just uh, uh, to the markup that describes how to paint a web page, which, which is what a lot of web addresses are pointing to. Where does EPCIS come into this uh, picture? Yeah, so so you know, Digital Link is is really the identification part of it. We we label uh, any trackable unit with a digital link, um, and that can be product items uh, or batches. You know, batches are usually the unit of uh, that we're talking about of uh, within supply chains, but product items, batches, cases, pallets, etc., they can all have digital links, and those digital links um, basically carry all of the information that we need uh, to be able to access them over the web, as you as you stated. So that's sort of how the digital link part of it and the identification part of it. Um, that by itself is not enough. You also have to have the ability to collect supply chain event information. So as a product or, or any trackable unit is using, is, is for example, moving from one location to another in sort of supply chain parlance, that is a, an, a, a supply chain event. Um, and that event needs to be captured and recorded somehow, some way, uh, and made available to other systems to be able to utilize that data. Again, that's all being done mostly today with proprietary systems. So I've got a proprietary way of capturing that data. I've got a proprietary way of storing it. I build proprietary APIs so people can I can share that with other people. Again, that's the problem, right? So what EPCS does is said, let's just standardize all that. Let's create a, a standardized data format, the who, what, when, where, why of, um, of any tracking event that occurs within the supply chain. Let's standardize the way that information is recorded. And let's standardize in a set of APIs where that information can be freely shared uh, between trading partners. So, you know, it's, it's really not very different, maybe not different at all from the operational steps um, that are performed today in supply chain operations around the world. Um, it's just moving it from being done in a proprietary way to a standards-based way. So those events might be location change uh, events. So if we want to look up and down the supply chain and see where a particular item is that we've ordered, then we might use EPCIS to see upstream. And if we're a manufacturer and we want to see where our products are downstream, then we could use those location change events so that if I'm uh, Unilever or I, the, a manufacturer of furniture for Ikea, I can get a sense of where things are. And if I can understand where they are, then I can understand inventory levels. And then suddenly I get some amazing information that's going to help regulate my production systems. And uh, I am basically manufacturing with the lights on up and down the supply chain rather than things disappearing from sight the moment they leave my factory. Is yeah, you fair? know, it's like supply chains are, they work great until they don't work. Um, and we got a pretty good glimpse of that um, with COVID where supply chains were massively disrupted um, and it caused some, you know, some very big problems around the world. Um, but they're kind of this, you know, there's there are these pristine cons constructions that don't tolerate um, deviations uh, very well. Um, and so, you know, what happens when, you know, there is a typhoon in the Pacific and um, my supplier is based in Okinawa, Japan, or in Japan or China or what have you, um, and um, they can't make that shipment to me anymore. Well, I've, obviously I'm building, you know, I'm depending on that for my business. I've got downstream commitments, you know, based on the re receiving those, those orders. Um, and right now, those you know, getting that information is very, very difficult. And so, the ability to sort of be malleable and agile, um, and to be able to react to those kind of real-time changes is quite difficult to do. But you really pointed it out. Once you've got visibility, visibility is power. Visibility is actionability. So once I can see what's going on, I can start to make you know business decisions um, that will allow me to be responsive um, and to be agile in the face of disruptions when the supply chain suddenly doesn't work as well as uh, as uh, it usually does. Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking about answering my own question about uh, how this can help companies be more profitable. But if I'm a retailer and I standard on EP standardize on EPCIS, then I can potentially do what Walmart pioneered, which is delegating responsibility for filling shelves 
to uh, my suppliers, I can say, look, I'm going to put a lot of cost price pressure on you, uh, but I'm going to sudden I'm going to start giving you information that allows you to run a much leaner supply chain, so you can get more of my business. You can sell more stuff to me um, because you can, um, you know, lower the price while still having margins because I'm going to share information about where your product is in my supply chain. So you've suddenly got this like really intimate bond between the retailer and the manufacturer, and um, they're able to cut the capital tied up in uh, inventory. Uh, they're able to run a leaner supply chain. They're able to drive down costs. I mean, you see like Tesla, what Tesla is doing, they have, they're driving down costs to uh, mercilessly and they are entering into price wars where they're making money and the opponents are losing money. So I think putting EPCIS in place can essentially give enterprises the same kind of capability. It's a way of engineering cost out of the supply chain and eliminating out of stock so you can sell more. Uh, so it's it's really, what? how can I run a supply chain if the lights are on and I'm switched on God mode, which allows me to see everything. And how much more money could I make if I, uh, I see all of that? So um, we've covered a lot, but uh, I'd like to hear a bit more about um, uh, your company and uh, you know, who's in it and uh, what you're doing is pretty revolutionary. Um, how did uh, um, uh, Track Vision uh, come about and who, who, who are the founders? Well, so yeah, my, aside from myself, there are a couple of other founders, um, as I as I mentioned, who are based over in London. Um, you know, we um, we are a, a group of folks that have been working together for a very long time and um, in a previous uh, enterprise. And um, you know, we saw the we were uh, we were kind of um, first party witnesses to the development of the standards that we're talking about. Um, you mentioned Dom Gennard, who. Uh, who we worked with quite closely, who was uh, instrumental in the development of both of those standards. So we got to see that that evolve. Um, you know, at the time, I think um, there may have been we felt there might have been an opportunity to capitalize on the um, the coming ratification of of EPCIS. Um, but you know, timing is everything, and um, we just weren't at a place in time within the organization that we were working for where we were able to uh, to proceed with that. Um, but we thought it was a really good idea, and um, uh, and so we just decided to get the team together um, and say, "Hey, let's go take a shot at this." Um, it's a pure play, um, you know. We're not trying to do anything other than provide supply chain solutions based on the standards. Um, we're going to live and, and die, um, uh, you know, on that proposition. Um, but we're very, very passionate about it. Um, we believe this is the way the world should operate. We think a lot of very good things will come out of this, a lot of benefits to society. We've talked about some. There are probably many others that we haven't scratched the surface of. Um, and um, we're passionate about it. So, um, you know, we're, we're a small, lean and mean team, but uh, we're working very hard toward uh, some worthwhile objectives. Well, I know you have some really amazing engineering talent, uh, a lot of experience with building the kind of serialization platforms that, that, that uh, is enabling what you're doing. So I'm sure that is helping you a lot. What is your connection with the Hubble telescope? <laughs> um, well, actually, um, so I majored in computer science and math. Um, and I'm going to date myself here because um, my first uh, my first programming class was um, was Fortran uh, on punch cards. Um, so literally, you punch a card, and one line of you know one line of uh, code is one card, and you put them into this card reader. Uh, I mean, just crazy to think about, given you know given how much we've advanced since then. But that's how I got my start, um, and I eventually focused on real time operating systems. Um, so that was really my focus and in college. Um, and uh, when I graduated, I had an opportunity to come out to California and work on the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, and um, I was on the team that uh, was responsible for de de developing the flight software. So on the Hubble, there's a flight computer that is essentially responsible for all the operations of the Hubble as a spacecraft. So how does it point? How does it harvest energy? 
How does it communicate back to Earth? Um, how does it um, interact with the magnetic field around the Earth? All of those things that that aren't about the science that it performs. All of that is done um, on the on the uh, with the flight software on the um, on the flight computer. Um, I'll tell you a funny little story about that. Um, the grand total of of the memory uh, on that flight computer is 48k, 48k words of memory. That's it. Um, and the original spec was that all systems would be triply redundant, and so the flight software was was supposed to fit within 16k. So we get up three copies of it on board and fail over if we needed to. Um, eventually, it launched with a consuming about 90 ish percent of that 48k. But you can imagine, you know, we're we're uh, saving every bit that we possibly can, and lots of time was was spent just trying to optimize algorithms so we could make things, you know, make things smaller. Um, but it was very gratifying. Obviously, the the Hubble has done, you know, just amazing things. Um, and you know, the nature of spacecraft is that you don't really. Um, you don't really update it much if you don't have to. There have been manned missions to uh, to the Hubble back when we had the space shuttle program. Uh, some of the instruments have been swapped out and so forth. Um, but the but the flight computer is the flight computer, and so you know some of that code that I wrote is is, is still out there orbiting the Earth somewhere. <laughs> wow, that is so cool. I'm uh, I'm I'm jealous. I'm tempted to compete with you with my. Um programming on paper tape story, but I am not going to go there, <laughs> okay. at least not on not whilst we're recording. So we have our traditional three favorite songs question, and uh, I'm interested in what you uh, decided your three songs would be. What's number one? Well, number one, uh, this is, uh, I'm sure you hear this all the time, but this is probably the hardest question you ask. Um, it is. And I had to dig deep, um, but I, I am, uh, I'm a, I guess I Kid that grew up in the '60s, um, and I was a little kid in the '60s, but I had older siblings, so I was exposed to a lot of, you know, popular music, rock and roll at that time. And of course, I became a big Beatles fan. So, I'd be very remiss if I didn't name a Beatles song. And and you know, probably I could, you know, any one out of ten I could probably agree with, but I had to settle on one. So I picked a day in the life. Yeah, oh, I, I I love uh, I love that, especially the ending. Um, <laughs> That's the one with the the, the piano, right? Where they, the, the, yeah, the big the, well, the m massive orchestra where they were just told to just play a you know chromatic scale, uh, you know, and um, it'll make a bunch of noise, and that's what we want, guys. So, and it was also really, I think, the one of the really clear collaborations between Lennon and McCartney. They're all they're all giving the song, you know, the, the songwriting credit to all of the music that they produce, but in reality, a lot of their songs were written separately. Um, but in this case, they really collaborated. So that middle bit um, is, of course, Paul McCartney and then John Lennon on the on the uh, the other parts. Yeah, and I, I, for me, that album is my favorite of uh, of everything they've produced. I thought it was interesting. I don't know if you've seen the um, the video that just recently came out, the last Beatles song, because we, yes. you know, we. I, I was born in the '60s as well, oh. um, and I. Um, there was something in Rolling Stone where they said, isn't it amazing that we're in 2023 and the Beatles and the Rolling Stones both <laughs> released new material <laughs> in the same month. Uh, <laughs> and actually, yeah, right. uh, the, the Rolling Stones uh, album, Hackney Diamonds, I think is pretty amazing, um, especially the last two songs, Lady yeah. Gaga and the one where they reprise their... Uh, um, their uh, uh, the, the the song where they got their name from but going back to the beatles mm -hmm. there's this amazing documentary about this last single which is the cleaned up recording from a cassette tape that yoko Rap. ono uh um gave to paul uh of john lennon essentially recording a demo which the quality was originally considered just not good enough but then peter jackson who 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 did the uh uh, that amazing uh, documentary about their creative process as well as Lord of the Rings and all that sort of thing cleaned up the audio and uh, separated out the, uh, the the piano from the, uh, it's just it's I, I don't know if you've seen that video but it's an amazing uh, yeah video. I've seen it people have different feelings about it I um, honestly I didn't love it um, and I, you know I thought they I mean I appreciate the effort um, and the sentiment behind it Um but I just thought it came out kind of clunky for my taste. 
Well, there's the promotional video, which I think is what you're talking about, where they kind of... Oh, yes, yes. But then there's the documentary right. about the making okay. of, and I, I, yeah, I can understand why you don't like the promotional video, but the, the, there's a little documentary yet on how they actually made it, and that was fascinating. Well, I did sit through the... Um the massive uh, get back sessions. I did that twice, actually. So really, uh, those are my bona fides of being a true Beatles fan. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I that gave my it made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. It was Unbelievable! Just really, yeah, amazing. just genius. So that's number one. What's yeah. number two? Well, um, number two is is not too far away, actually. So you may remember um, or know that when the Beatles broke up. Toward the end of their career together, they started their own label called Apple Records, uh, actually. And um, it didn't last very long, um, and they didn't have very many uh, acts. But one of them uh, was a, a group called Badfinger. Um, and um, they had a lot of help from the Beatles. They had a few hits, actually, that were um, one of which was written by um, Paul McCartney called Come and Get It. Um, and they had a few others, but um, so I've loved them forever. I think I thought some of those songs were just fantastic. Um, and the Beatles played on a number of those. George Harrison plays the slide guitar um, on uh, on one of them, and he plays that brilliantly. Um, however, um, if you were a fan of um, the Breaking Bad series, um, you may remember that the, the very last scene, the musical accompaniment, uh, is a song called Baby Blue by Badfinger. Uh, and I loved that song before, and I almost love it even more now that it has that association. <laughs> I love hearing these uh, these uh, favorites because it gives me an excuse to dig into it. So I actually don't know Badfinger very well, and I will dig into it. I think another artist they had on Apple they signed up from and, and promoted from obscurity was James Taylor, who's, who's pretty good. Pretty good yeah, he's find. not too bad. He's he's made a few songs. <laughs> very good. <laughs> So uh, ama two amazing choices, and, and what's your last one? Well, now I'm going to throw you a curveball because um, through all of that, uh, somehow I became um, a country music fan, and I listened to country music um, quite a lot, um, more into my kind of 20s, I guess, 20s and 30s. Country music went through a huge change in the early 80s. Um, it was sort of, the genre was almost hijacked in some ways by by record companies, and it 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 was sort of transformed to something that is to me not really recognizable as what I would call traditional country music. You know, the the Merle Haggards and the Johnny Cashes and the George Jones and folks like that. But um, but I have to say, there's one song that if I if I could ever only listen to one song again, this might be the one. And it's it's a it's a it's a song called Sunday Morning Coming Down. Um, it was written by Chris Christopherson. Uh, and it was a um, it was a favorite of Johnny Cash's. He played it a lot. He played it at most of his live performances, um, and uh, it's just brilliant. Um, it uh, it evokes some um, bittersweet feelings um, that were probably reflective of uh, maybe what was going on in his life, or perhaps Chris Christopherson's life uh, at that time. Um, it's a very powerful ballad, uh, and I think worth listening to. I'm going to take that uh, suggestion seriously and, and listen to it. I have to say, being a Brit, I've always found it a little difficult to uh, relate to country music, although there are a lot of country music fans in, in England, in, mm -hmm. in Great Britain. Yeah. Um, but Lyle Lovett is kind of the closest I've got to really... Okay. Yeah, he's uh, pretty good. Yeah, I, I remember going to uh, one of his concerts in Portland, Oregon, where he stopped the concert in the middle and said, whoever's smoking pot, Stop it. Otherwise, I'm out of here. <laughs> I, I was like, oh, my goodness. So oh, there's goodness. a clean living person. Um, yeah, I guess. And, uh, yeah, that would have cleared out, cleared out the concert all these days. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Very good. Well, Kurt, I have really enjoyed those, and I've really enjoyed uh, talking to you. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you so much, Steve. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for watching this episode of the Mr. Beacon Ambient IoT podcast here on YouTube. You can listen to this episode on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you enjoyed it, please like and share this video. And be sure to subscribe for more videos. For more information about Williot, Ambient IoT, and IoT Pixels, head over to williot.com.